Well, it is Resurrection Sunday. Amen, 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 McQuinta. It is Resurrection Sunday, and I refuse to let COVID-19, coronavirus, steal my praise. Come on, I need somebody who'll just say it. I refuse to let this steal my praise. My nephew, our nephew, Terrell Lawson, I love him with the love of life and the Lord. I refuse to let anything steal my praise. God is still worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. I wrote to preachers yesterday and this morning and reminded them, while the places and the settings that we preach in have changed, the message stays the same. It is still true. He got up with all power in his hand. I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the passage that Pastor Kelly led us in the reading and the hearing of Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, compose and comprise the contextual environment. I'm going to zero in, sort of laser-like, on that sixth verse of chapter 16 from the writing of Mark. Mark 16, verse 6. But he, that's the angel, said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Here it is. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. For about 20 minutes, I want to preach this Resurrection Sunday, I want to preach to Rel from the subject, the blessing of his absence. The blessing of his absence. You can be seated, presence of the Lord. Beloved, I don't know if you're aware of this. I do not know if you've ever taken time, ponder it, muse it, think about it. But the fact of the matter is, one of the great promises, in fact, one of the great and precious promises of the word of God and of the Christian faith is that promise vouchsafed, given to us, that no matter where we are and no matter what we're going through, no matter what we face, no matter what we fight, and not even what we fear, there is nothing that comes between us and our God. The promise of the Bible, the promise of the Christian faith is the promise that our God is always with us. In fact, beloved, it may be that this expression, this exclamation as it were, is unique in many ways to the Judeo-Christian experience. The fact that our God is present with us. Not just as a deity to be worshipped, but as a father to be known and to be experienced. That is what the Westminster, one of the oldest confessions of the Christian faith, raises when it lifts this query, raises this interrogative, asks this question. And what is the chief end of man and the answer is the chief end of man watch this is to know God and to enjoy him forever you didn't get it you sitting there I didn't hear you shout I'm going to say it again Westminster Confession says in its questioning what is the chief end of man now Deacon Yolanda Cox, let me stop right there because when the question is raised, what is the chief end of man? That is not referring to gender. It is not about a male. What is the chief end of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl made in the image and likeness of God? What is their raison d'etre? What is the reason for their existence? Existence. What is the chief end of all of our lives? And here, beloved, 
is the answer. The chief end of every man and every woman and every boy and every girl, are you ready? It's not to own a big house or drive a big car or make a lot of money. Nothing wrong with that, but that is not the chief end of our lives. Chief end of our lives, Westminster Confession says, is to know God. And not only to know God, but are you ready for this, Frida? They're not going to believe it. To know God. Now, now I could. I'm going to stop because my, my preacher friends ragged me all last week about how long I preached on Palm Sunday. So I'm going to cut it short. But if I had time, I'd argue I could shout right there on just, hey, Renee, knowing God. It's a wonderful, powerful, beautiful, exciting, exhilarating thing to know God. Not just intellectually, not just conceptually, not just in the sense of knowledge, but to know him for yourself. Chief in the man is to know God. That's good by itself. But wait a minute, y'all. The Westminster Confession goes further and says, and to enjoy him forever. Can you imagine that? That the purpose of my life, my, my reason for existence is to know God. To know him in a real, dynamic, personal, powerful way. And then watch this, trustee chairman, and to enjoy him forever. Now, I know, I know some of y'all still can't believe it. It flies in the face of everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever been taught, everything you've ever believed. Because so many of us grew up with an image of God as this ogre, this mean, vindictive, angry, surly, upset being who's out to get us and trap us and hurt us. What an image of God that is so unreal. That is not the God of the Bible and that's not the God of our experience. We serve a good God. And Deacon Dwayne Washington, chairman of our diaconate ministry, listen, and when we know him, are y'all ready for this? It positions us and puts us in place, here it is, that we can enjoy him forever. I don't know about you, but Felicia Hintz, I tell you now what the old folks said, I, I'm heaven bound and I'm enjoying the journey. A whole lot of folk are saved and mad and saved and sad. But thanks be to God, I wish I had help here. I am saved and I'm glad about it. Because this joy that I have, the world did not give it. And the world, Sylvia, cannot take it away. You and I are blessed. You and I are privileged. Are you in the room with me? Well, I know you're not, but are you feeling me? You and I are blessed and we are privileged to be partakers and participants in this marvelous experience of grace and fellowship in which we not only know God, but we enjoy him forever. That is, that is what the faith that we embrace teaches us. That is what the faith that we hold to. And can I add this? That holds to us. It is what it assures us that our God is always with us. That we serve a present God. We see this in Genesis opening book of the Bible when every day God comes into the garden in the cool of the day to share, to meet, to walk, to talk with Adam and Eve. We see it in Exodus when God goes with Israel as they make their trek from Egypt to the promised land, a pillar of cloud and fire that follows them as they go. We see it in the lives of individuals in the Bible who realize, especially at dark times in their lives, that God was with them like Joseph or Jacob 
or Abraham or David or Esther or Ruth and Naomi always discovering at the, I feel like preaching this at the lowest place of their lives what the late Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor would call the nadar of their lives the lowest place of their lives in those moments God showed up I wonder, do I have anybody on Resurrection Sunday who can shout online and tell somebody he showed up? Y'all going to make me preach quicker, harder than what I planned. But just go ahead and post it if you feel like you can. And just type it in. He showed up in the midst of my pain and my suffering and my agony, my perplexity and my problems. In the midst of my darkness and my despair. When I did not know how I was going to make it. And did not know if I was going to make it. Thanks be to God, he showed up showed up he showed up he did it for adam and eve he did it for ruth and naomi he did it for esther he did it for david he did it for joseph he did it for abraham he did it for moses he did it for my mama and my grandmother and he did it for us as well we serve a god who shows up and we see it not only in, in, in the Old Testament with Moses and Noah and, and Rachel and Abraham and with Esther and with Ruth and Naomi. No, we also see it supremely in Jesus, God incarnate who comes among us. His presence, beloved, gives us peace and poise no matter what we face. And yet, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this on Resurrection Sunday 2020? Elder Charles Williams, are you ready for this? Watch this. His presence gives us peace and poise no matter what we face. The promise of, of our faith, the promise of the word of God is that our God is not removed, not distant, not off. He's near us, nigh us, close to us. But then watch this, y'all. The text reveals a time. When for all intents and purposes, Jesus was not there. Wow. Let me just say this and I'll move on. We all know what that's like, don't we? Especially in these days of COVID-19, coronavirus. We all know what that's like. There are times when... It seems as if Jesus, despite what he promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you. There are times we feel he is not there. Times when we don't sense him, when we cannot see him. And because we don't sense him and we cannot see him, it's often difficult for us to trust him when we can't trace him. There are times when, like Job, we want to cry out from our mat of misery and our pallet of pain. Oh, I wish I knew where I could find him. Beloved, what's amazing, what grips us in this moment, what grips us about the occasion of our text. Are you ready for this? Work with pastor. I'm coming at this a different way. I know this isn't traditional, but work with me. What's amazing, what grips us in this moment, this morning, and the morning and the moment of the text we're looking at is that on that morning, that first resurrection morning, that first Easter Sunday morning, his presence was a blessing, but so was his absence. Yeah, we always get excited when he's present, but on that morning, it wasn't his presence that was the blessing. It was his absence. You don't believe me, do you? Kim Mosley Watson, look at the text. Verse 6, about midway the text. There it is right there. About midway, I guess that would be the C clause of verse 6. Here it is. He is not here. <laughs> Y'all missed it. Yeah, that's all I got. That's all, that's all she wrote. The pencil broke. That's it. That one statement, that one line, C clause, verse 6. He is not here. All right, absent. <laughs> okay, let me try it this way. Pastor Kelly, not where we left him. Not where we put him. Not where we last saw him. 
I feel this real good now. Not where we expected him to be. We got up this morning. We came in the dark to anoint his body. We expected his remains to be present. Hey, y'all. And he is absent. And he's not accounted for. And the angel simply says, the nerve of the angel, he is not here. <laughs> Sister Melanie Murdo, I know what that's like. There have been some times in your pastor's life when I felt I heard somebody say, he is not here. In my pain, in my grief, in my sorrow, there have been moments when I felt like those women at the tomb must have felt. What do you mean he's not here? We left him here. We put him here. We expect him to be here. And then comes the word of this, I preached it years ago, this glorious disappointment. He is not here. And his absence is a blessing. I know you don't believe it. I know you've been, you've been upset with God since, since you got sheltered in place. You, you've been fussing and fuming and fighting ever since. Uh, you, you can't go out, can't go to the restaurant, can't go to the movies, can't go here. Can, you've been agitated and angry and upset. But I came to tell somebody tonight, today, calm down. It's going to be all right. Because even in his absence, Denise Gowdy, there's a blessing. <laughs> what is? I know you're wondering. I know Deacon Cox, they wondering. What in the world is Pastor up there preaching about? He must be hot in that robe and he's delirious. No, I'm not really hot. My grandson told me today. He said, he said, Grandpa, why are you wearing that robe? He said, you got to be hot. I said, no, I'm a preacher. The Holy Ghost keeps me cool. <laughs> And then I told him, I said, now, Pug, I said, when you take over, you got to keep the tradition alive. And, and every now and then you put on a robe and you just say, I know y'all wondering why I got this on. I'm doing this for my grandpa. If he were here, he'd have it on. But I want y'all to know that even in this robe today, I want to confess and I want to challenge us that we must learn how to embrace the blessing of his absence. He is not here. Oh, we love it. We love it, LaShonda. We love it, Nina. We love it, Deacon Cox. We love it when he is here. But what do we do? How do we handle those moments in our lives? Herschel and Linda Craig, brother and sister Elliot, trustee and sister Elliot, what do we do, Minister Jerry, in those moments? When the word that comes to us from eternity and from our own existential experience is, he's not here. <laughs> he's not here. Well, well, here's the question, and we'll go, because I'm not going to have these preachers calling me, texting me today, talking about how long I preach. Here's the first word. Lawrence Calloway, here's the first word. There's a blessing in his absence. Here's why. Because first and foremost, maybe, his absence is a sign that death does not win. Ha. In his death, praise team is helping me. In his death and in his resurrection, Jesus declares from an empty grave that death does not have the final word. In fact, Paul says that death reigned over there in 1 Corinthians, that death reigned from Adam up until, I, I want to shout, boy, I tell you, I want somebody to get behind the organ, but we ain't going to do that. But here it is, death reigned from Adam until, and the until was, it ran into Jesus. And the moment death ran into Jesus, the moment it had reigned, Adam had died, Eve had died, Lot had died. Come on, y'all ain't helping me here. Abraham and Moses and Joshua had died. Miriam had died. All of them had died. David and Joseph and Mary and Martha and Lazarus. All of them had died. But when it ran into Jesus, 
That's when death met its match. And the fact Jesus was not there is a blessing because it tells me that death does not have the final word. Yesterday, we sent trustee chairman emeritus Willie Lee Gaddis home. And I, I thought, I thought as he went out, I could not even escort him out the building because of our shelter in place and, and, and physical distancing. And I stood here and watched as his body, his remains rolled down the aisle. And I thought to myself, and you think death, you win. No, not for the child of God. No, the fact he was absent, he is not here, says that death does not have final word. Well, well how do we know that? Three ways and I'll move on. Because Jesus in his death confronts death. He confronts it. And then Jesus in his death contends with death. I, I want to say something about all of these, but I don't have time. He confronts, he doesn't back up from it. He doesn't run from it. He confronts death and then he contends with it. He faces it and he fights it. He contends with death. Um, in fact, the, the, the late um, Bishop uh, Chandler David Owens used to talk about uh, death uh, having a, was like a boxing match. And it went 12 rounds and 15 rounds with everybody till it got to Jesus. And that's when the fight ended because he not only confronts death, he contends with death. And here, see, y'all grab it and, and go on with it. Here's the next one. And Jesus conquers death. Reason why death doesn't have the final word, death doesn't win, is because our Lord has confronted death on its own territory, on its own turf, on its own ground. And in confronting it, he contends with it. And having contended with it, he conquers it. And so he is not here. What a, what a blessing his absence is. Because the fact he's absent, McQuinta says, oh, former trustee Daryl Stewart living now in, in Dallas, Texas, a, a member there of my friend and brother, Pastor Brian Carter Concord. You tell the whole family we send love. We love you. Give Cynthia and the family our love. He, he confronts death. He contends with death. And then on resurrection morning, he conquers death well then here's the second point his absence is a blessing it's a blessing because his absence that day he is not here the angel says to those shocked surprised frightened frustrated women he is not here wow what a statement after all the work they went through he is not here but his absence is a sign that the grave now has a way out there's a cemetery here in our city. If I named it, you would know it. Many of you have loved ones buried there. It's a cemetery here in our city that when you enter it, some of you never paid attention to it, but it's such a homiletical statement and my mind won't let anything go. There's a sign when you pull in to this cemetery here in our city, and here's what the sign says, two words, no exit. Pull into the cemetery, cemetery here in our city. When you pull into it, you never saw it. You never paid attention to it. But I'm a preacher, and uh, there are sermons in stones, the writer said. So I'm always looking for a sermon. Oh, my sister, Sister Jacqueline Fair Ruffin, I love you, sis. Listen, there's a sign at the entrance of this cemetery here in our city. Here's what it says, two words, sign. Here's two words, all it says, no exit. Beloved, that's what the grave would have us believe. <laughs> the grave. That, that, that's why, God, I feel like preaching that. that, that that's why when, when, when we go to the cemetery, we scream and we holler because we believe the sign that there's no exit. It's why our hearts break and we want to stay because we believe the sign there's no exit. We believe we have drank the Kool-Aid and we want to believe the hype and we listen to the sign that there is no exit. But I thought I'd get up on resurrection morning to make an announcement that his absence is a blessing because his absence says that there's a way out of the grave. 
It's not true that there is no exit at the cemetery. The grave would have us believe that, but the absence of Jesus on that first getting up morning announced in clear and clarion and even compelling terms, there is a way out of the grave. I'll give you three of them and we'll go. First way out of the grave requires that we go to it. Yeah, I know. I know. That's a bummer. That's a downer. I know y'all are mad now. But Gerard Watkins, I know y'all mad now. Uh, no, we got to go. We got to go to it. Yeah, our way out requires that we go to the grave. We got to go to it. Man, I think it's uh, Ecclesiastes says, man goes to his long home. Mourners go about in the streets. We, we, we got to go to it. Um, and, then, and then, Pastor Kelly, I, I know we don't want to hear this, but the way out of the grave not only requires that we go to it, but that we go into it. Yeah, we, we, oh, we got to be buried, whether in a mausoleum or grave or even in cremation. We, we all have to go into it. Um, I, I know, I know, that's unsettling. Y'all are, y'all are saying, Pastor, man, that's, uh, that, that's bad news. No, it isn't, it isn't bad news. We got to go to it, and then we got to go into it. Uh, but then now y'all can breathe a sigh of relief because the way out of the grave requires that we go to it, got to go to it, got to go into it, but then watch this, we go through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't stay there. I, I, I've told this story over the years uh, about my travel. Um, anybody who knows me and anyone who has worked for me as my administrative assistant knows that I like as many non, now I got to do it right, non-stop flights as I can get. Child, I like non-stop. I like to go up one time, fly, land, get off. Uh, but, but, you know, I can't always get a nonstop flight, and that means I got to get off, get my bag, change, walk down the terminal, find the gate, go through that whole stuff all over again. So, several years ago, I forget who my administrative assistant was. might have been Leah Crystal or Kim or Sister Gwen. I can't remember who it was. It was some years ago. And uh, they, they were telling me, uh, Pastor, I, I couldn't get you. I couldn't get you a nonstop flight. And they, they saw I was crestfallen, and I was really kind of, you know, feeling some kind of way about it. And, and they said, but, but I did the next best thing. I got you a straight through. And I said, well, well, what, pray tell what is a straight through. And, and I can't remember now who it was. They, they said, well, pastor, nonstop means you get on and uh, you get up in the air, you fly, you land, you get off. Said, now a straight through flight isn't a nonstop. Said, you get on and the plane takes off and then the plane lands in another city, but you don't get off. You stay on that same plane, and it'll take you through to where you're trying to go. Y'all didn't hear it. You got you to get on, and you got to lift off. You got to fly. You got to come back down, but you don't get off. You stay on the plane. Stay in your seat, because that's the same plane that's going to take you through to your city. I, I feel like shouting right there. I should have saved that for a Sunday. Y'all went back, and that's all death is, y'all, that I got to go to the grave, and then I got to go into the grave but thanks God I go through the grave because I got me a straight through flight that I get on and I go down and I go up and when I get up I'm headed to the city and I wish I had somebody that could shout right there holla I'm on a straight through flight this world is not my home I'm only passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue the angels beckon me from heaven's open door but Jerry Hammond and I can't feel at home in this world anymore stories told of a I gotta go I'm enjoying it too much stories told of, of, of a man who rode the bus to work and from work every day got off about five time he got on the bus made his change transfer um it was starting to get dark and uh, the driver noticed that every day that man got off his bus and went to the cemetery and uh, 
he knows, he said, well, maybe his wife passed and he's going to put flowers on the grave. But the man had no flowers. And he said, well, maybe he's not going to put flowers down. He's just going to visit the tomb and uh, then he's going to come out. But he noticed one day the man never came out. And so uh, the next day he watched. The man did the same thing, got off the bus and uh, went in the cemetery but didn't come out. That happened for about four or five days. Finally, curiosity got the best of him. So when the man got on the bus at work that day, he said, excuse me, so I'm not nosy. I don't get in other folks' business. He said, but I, I noticed, Frida, I noticed that when I let you off, you go through the cemetery, and I thought maybe you had uh, somebody there you loved, and you went by to see the grave, but you never come out. I said, why would you go in a cemetery at night? And the man chuckled and smiled. He said, Oh, sir. He said, no, no, no problem. You're not being nosy. He said, um, the only reason I go through the cemetery is because I live on the other side of the cemetery. And it's quicker for me to walk through it than to go around it so I can get to my house on the other side. And I guess I'm just trying to tell somebody who laid a loved one to rest in the middle of COVID-19 that all they did was walk through the cemetery because their house is on the other side. I got a home over yonder where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Mary, hey sis, it's good to know that's what Ben got. Ben went to the cemetery and then he went into the cemetery but thanks be to God one day he coming out of there because we got to go through the cemetery. Well, here's the last point. I know y'all glad to hear it. The blessing of his absence. He is not here. The blessing of his absence is that death does not win. The blessing of his absence is that the grave has a way out finally. And then the blessing of his absence is a sign that he waits for us to meet him. That's the message of that morning. Glory to God. Uh, Sister Lisa Shelley, I thought about y'all today. Give the fellas my love. Listen, listen. That's the message of that morning. Rev. Nancy, uh, but Joe, Sister Serena, come. That, that's the message of that morning. But guess what else? That's the message of this morning as well. He is not here. In that, look, look, verse 7. He is not here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Remember what he told you? Woo! He, he is not here. Remember what he told you? Meet me in Galilee. <laughs> Jesus, I love it. Listen, go tell his disciples. Go to and Peter. Don't make me preach that. Not, not just, why didn't he just say go tell his disciples? But go tell his disciples and Peter. In other words, I know the last time Peter saw me, he was cussing and swearing and denying that he knew me. But go tell my boys and Peter that I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him like he told. Didn't he tell you that when all this was over, meet me in Galilee? I wish somebody would type it in there, meet me in Galilee. Yeah, yeah, his absence is a blessing because it's a sign that he waits to meet us. Let me give you three places and we close. He, he meets us at the end of the day. That's all life is. It's just a day. He meets us at the end of the day. And uh, beloved, that's, uh, that, that's my hope that when my day is done, when our day is done, our Lord, because he was absent, not present and accounted for in that tomb, thank God he meets us. He waits to meet us at the end of the day. And then B, he waits to meet us at the exit of this life. Uh, the late Dr. Sandy Frederick Ray, whose death, his anniversary of his death was yesterday, Dr. Ray used to say about preaching, he said, I preach like I drive in New York. I stay in the right lane, and I get off at my exit. <laughs> That's good preaching. I stay in the right lane, and I get off at my exit. I'm so glad Jesus waits to meet me at the end of the day. 
Jesus waits to meet me at the exit of this life. The moment you and I exit this life, don't get me started. He's waiting to meet us. Glory to God. When we draw our last breath, he's waiting to meet us at the exit of this life. God, I wish somebody could grab a hold of that. At the end of my day, if it's a 90-year day, if it's a 70, if like Didi, it's a 40-year day, however long my day is, he, me, he waits to meet me at the end of my day. And he waits to meet me at the exit of this life. And then I got closed. And he waits to meet all of us at the entrance of the city. God, I feel like preaching that, that as soon as, as our feet strike Zion and I get to the holy city, he's going to welcome me. Isn't that this? I think John P. Key and his choir sang it. He'll welcome me. Yeah, that's the, that's the word. That, I remember my friend and brother, uh, the late Bishop Gregory L. Dixon. Man, Greg loved that song. Whenever the choir at First Church in L.A. would sing that song, he'll welcome me. You, some of y'all who knew Bishop knew that Greg loved to dance, man. And he'd get to dance. I'd be sitting next to him. I'd be there for revival, and I'd almost start counting down 10, 9, 8, because I knew in about seven more minutes, seven more seconds, Greg was going to take off shouting. And one day on an airplane on his way to Chicago, he died in the middle of the air, and Jesus welcomed him at the entrance of the city. And I'm so glad. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, I'm going to throw it all to the wind now. I'm so glad that one glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on, I feel now, Mother Malone, to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Would you tell a neighbor, neighbor, he'll welcome me at the end of the day, at the exit of my life, at the entrance of the city, a city for square, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearls there's a tree in the middle of the city whose leaves are good i feel like putting all my weight on it for the healing of the nation there's 12 gates in the city three gates in the east three gates in the west three gates in the north three gates in the south oh what a beautiful city oh what a beautiful city. Oh, what a beautiful city. Twelve gates in the city. Hallelujah. And there's a throne in the city. And on the throne, there's one like unto the Son of God. And angels and cherubims and seraphims bow down, cry, Holy, Holy holy worthy is the lamb and i shall see him i shall see him i shall see him in his beauty over there in his likeness i'll behold him he for me is waiting at the portals is there anybody here who knows you're gonna see him some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We're going to sing and shout, shout and sing. He is not here. He is risen. And I'm happy that he is absent. I'm happy he's not there. I'm happy the tomb is empty. I'm happy the stone is rolled away. I'm happy because I know one morning I'll see him and I shall be changed. 
in a moment in the twinkling of an eye yeah yeah hallelujah yeah can i ask you one question we ain't been together in almost a month can i ask you one question as i get ready to sit out ain't he all right ain't he all right on resurrection morning ain't he all right yeah at the house with somebody else just turn to him and tell him he's not here <laughs> thank God for the blessing of his absence it must have sent shock waves through the psyche of those women to hear those words he is not here but what a blessing his absence was and is because he is not here not there he is here, but he, he's not there. He's not there. He's not there. Rand, Randall, he's not there. He's not there. That tomb is empty. And it means death does not have the final word. It means there is, thank God, in spite of what that sign at the cemetery says, there is an exit. There's a way out of the grave. And it means that he... Uh, is waiting on us to meet him at the end of the day at our exit from this life and at our entrance into the city Nikita that's the hope we holding on to daughter that's the hope we go we're gonna hold on to Johnny Clifton family that's what we holding on to today